All right, so we're going to look at today is a couple things. Uh, I'll be as brief as possible. I'm not going to really go into a ton of detail because really the stuff we're going to talk about applies to both sides and a lot of countries. So I'm really not going to go into each specific country too much. I might give a couple examples, but I'm mostly just going to talk about how aspects of World War One were uh, had total war, which we talked about a little bit last week. And then I'm also going to talk about how it affected the home front, which is obviously a component of total war. Yeah? Is it important to like, know the specific examples with the countries? I would know some, just because if you, you know, it's, it's one of those deals, like let's say you're writing an essay on the home front of total war. You know, part of your essay is, of course, supporting your arguments of facts. And, uh, you, of course, you can generally describe things, and that goes so far. But, of course, having a couple examples that definitely prove you're right, those are obviously useful. So I would know some if you can. And already you should know some. You know from some of your study guide. You also know some from even last year. I mean, when we talked about World War I last year, the heavy emphasis we had was on the home front for the United States. So, of course, that applies here today as well. So, anyways, we're going to talk about pretty generally, though, in class. All right, so the first thing we're looking at is mobilization for war, uh, how countries prepared to go to war. And there's economic mobilization. Of course, there's manpower uh, mobilization. So there's a lot of different things you can do. All right, so let's first talk about economic mobilization. This slide kind of sums it up. Uh, you can look at it. I'll just read it to you. Um, you can see there, uh, both sides, both sides to some degree, okay, all uh, engaged in mobilization. What's this? Coke, Coke, Coke. Just, you're randomly bringing me a Coke? Yep. Does it have an origin? Miss um, Robinson. Tell her thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I'll take notes for you random coats. That means she'll ask a favor of you later. That's what I expect. <laughs> In that case, I hope it is poison. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, what did they do? So we're talking about to produce necessary war equipment, governments had to take greater control of their economy. So everything, you know, we talk about total war, you've got to mobilize everything you have because. If you don't, and another country does, you will lose. Okay, so this meant getting out every citizen to work or fight, restructuring economies so that they are geared towards wartime production. I mean, you guys are familiar with this stuff. We've talked about it before. This is just review. So when you look at it, all available citizens were put to work. Unemployment nearly ended, and neutral countries like the USA were able to profit by trading. So even you know, you look at countries who weren't even initially in the war. Like we benefited. Because we could supply these countries. And of course, ultimately, you know, theoretically, we were neutral. But because of the strength of the Allied blockade, we were really only seriously ever doing business with one side, and that was the Allies. So you know, our neutrality uh, was very superficial. Okay? So you know, war did have a positive effect. I mean, our economy during World War I boomed. Okay? And I think we watched a video a couple weeks ago in which there was a guy who was talking about how he remembered his dad and how his paycheck was all so much bigger now because of the war, because we were working overtime. I mean, our factories never shut down because someone had to produce. And of course, us being the industrial power of the world, we were carrying a lot of the, the, the industrial capacity for the, for the allies. But everyone was doing this to some degree, though some were doing it better than others. It's argued that the allies probably industrialized, that not only were they more industrialized, but they probably better mobilized their industry for war in World War I, and they probably did the same in World War II. We're going to look at that later. By the way, just a sign up before we move on. It's really important you get this, and it's not hard to get, and here's why. Everything we're talking about here is not only important in World War I, everything we're learning applies to World War II. If you learn it once, you've learned it twice. Everything that we talk about today applies to World War II, but on just a bigger scale. World War II is like, you know, like a movie sequel. You know, it's bigger, you know, there's, there's more going on, you know, they try to, it's, it's just everything is on a much larger scale, you know, the, the amount of people involved, the death toll, the amount of money spent, I mean, everything about World War II is bigger, but everything applies. Everything absolutely from World War I applies to World War II. So learn it once, learn it twice. Okay, so obviously, you know, here's some stuff that you're already aware of, but we'll remind you, you know, how the war effort, because you needed massive mobilization, this meant tapping into every resource you had. And when you talk about the labor force, women, were a kind of a resource that really a lot of countries tapped into during the war. You know, women were typically in these days, in most of these countries, were excluded from certain types of work because women, of course, were regarded as second-class citizens. You know, most of the countries we're talking about here did not have women's suffrage, including the United States. 
Okay, they did not allow women to work in certain fields because they were considered to be male dominated fields. Okay, but because so many men were required to fight in this war, women now had increased opportunities. So you know, you saw women in many of these countries now find for the first time themselves having access to jobs in industry, heavy industry, which was normally restricted from them. You know, look at this picture here. This is a munitions factory. Uh, never in peacetime would we consider women in this time period working in a factory like this. And this was, you know, hard and dangerous work. Munitions factories were very dangerous. And yes, there, you know, occasionally were accidents, you know, things would, you know, a shell would explode and people would die. But of course, this had to be done. And of course, every woman that took a job like this freed up a man to go serve in a combat role on the front. And of course, we had uh, huge needs for, for combat, uh, you know, occupations. All right, now you look at other groups that were affected, you know, you talk about race and race relations and things like that. You know, in the United States, the war also opened up opportunities for African Americans. Not only were women finding themselves increasingly participating in the workforce and industry, but so were blacks. You know, during the war, we saw the beginnings of what was called the Great Migration. You can look at the timeline there. The Great Migration was, of course, this demographic shift in which many African Americans moved from the rural South to northern cities where they took up work in industrial factories. Now, of course, uh, this meant increased uh, economic opportunity. But, of course, there was the downside, which was, of course, race relations in this country in the North got more tense. You know, we like to think of the North as this, like, progressive, accepting place when it comes to race. You know, of course, in the Civil War, the North was opposed to slavery. But that's not necessarily the case. The North did oppose slavery, and yes, there was probably more progressive thought on race in the North and the South. But the North was not devoid of racism. In fact, some historians have actually argued that the North in a lot of ways displayed more racism in the South. So when blacks did move North and found work in these cities and moved in mass amounts, this influx of new workers caused racial tension. And actually set off a lot of uh, you know, racial violence. You know, some of the worst race riots in our country's history actually took place during this era. You know, there was a particularly bad one in Chicago, the Chicago race riot, where whites reacted to competition with these new black migrants for jobs. Okay, so yes, wars did you know increase economic opportunity, but they also did sometimes inflame tensions. Now, of course, this is all temporary. But let's make sure this is clear. Women and blacks. Uh, this was not a permanent advancement for their status. Women were not expected to maintain their position in the economy like this permanently. This was temporary. It was a temporary solution to a problem. When the war ended and men came home, women were expected to step down and give up their jobs. And at this time, most women accepted that. So I would say that the war did not lead to many significant advancements for women's rights okay, in this country. However, it has also been argued that women's suffrage, at least in the United States, was granted to women largely as a reward for their help in World War I. It was like, kind of like, you know, you guys really were instrumental to us winning. We needed you. You helped out. So to kind of reward you, here's, here's the vote. So yes, there were advances politically, although they were indirect. But when we talk about economic advancements for minorities, a lot of times these advances were short-lived. Okay. So even after World War II, we see short-lived economic opportunities for women, and then women a lot of times left the workforce. Women were still largely, re you know, um, regarded to be, you know, you know, useful in certain jobs, you know, clerical jobs or teaching jobs and things like that. Women were still usually largely prohibited from entering into the industrial world. Of course, this has changed a lot today, although not uh, completely. All right, so conscription obviously is a big deal. So when we're talking about conscription, we're talking about forcing a populace to fight. You know, when you're in a total war, you need a large military. And World War I, of course, saw the largest militaries the world had ever seen, so everyone was conscripting at some point. So in order to supply the front lines with enough soldiers, governments used conscription, or a military draft that required men to fight. Now, all countries had volunteers as well. In the beginning of the war, as in all wars, volunteers are usually easy to come by. Because when a war breaks out, everyone wants to serve, they want to demonstrate, you know, that they, you know, they have what it takes and they want to prove themselves and they want to go experience the, the excitement of the battlefield and combat. And then of course a couple years in the war, when the death toll starts to mount and people realize just what war is, and war is not glorious, okay, 
then the numbers start to fall off. And it doesn't matter if it's World War I or the Civil War, numbers began to taper off. You can see by 1916, it was pretty clear that the war was not some great adventure. It was a, you know, a, a brutal, bloody war of attrition with the trench warfare. And, you know, that stuff was eventually getting to the home front. People were realizing just how bad it was, whether it be through the news or letters or whatever. So when that happens, conscription comes out. You gotta, you gotta draft people, okay? So conscription usually took the form of some kind of uh, lottery system, a randomized lottery system. People who are in an eligible group, usually men ages 18 to 50, depending on the needs, which seems like a really big group, right? Because that, that, you know, that, that age group will expand to meet the needs of the war. Okay, when you when your needs you you can you know kind of broaden that out. Fifty is pretty old. I mean, you can't even enlist in the military uh, in this country. I believe it's after thirty-seven. You can't voluntarily enlist. Okay, because at that point you're getting to the age where physically you might not be able to meet all the requirements of you know, basic training and stuff like that. But you know, in wartime, you, you take what you can get. You know, you need more people, so they oftentimes will relax the rules and uh, more people will be drafted because that's just how desperate they were for men. So you see, men, roughly 18 to 50, would be drafted. And of course, it was a lottery system. But well, as we've seen in American history, a lot of times these drafts, um, they had loopholes in various countries and ways to avoid them. And of course, you know, as is the case with every war in history, you know, we tended to see disproportionately the number of people who get drafted or who were forced to enlist or whatever tend to be people who are disadvantaged, you know, disadvantaged groups, poor groups, things like that, They're usually the ones who end up fighting uh, on the front lines. All right, so look at these charts here. You can look at the numbers that were actually kind of put up by each side for the war, and you can see um, on the Allied side, you know, they had a much larger military presence by war's end, 40 plus million troops, as opposed to the Central Powers who had about 25 million. Okay, and large numbers of these would have been uh, draftees, people who were conscripted. Okay, this chart's also interesting to look at because look at the numbers. Look at who was putting up how many. I mean, you can see there that you know even though the Allies vastly outnumbered the Central Powers, you know it didn't necessarily mean uh, you know an overwhelming victory. I mean, look at Russia for example. Russia of all the Allied countries put up the most men, 13 million. Yet Russia also had the most battlefield losses. So sometimes numbers don't tell the whole story when it comes to you know performance in a war, but typically you know in a war of attrition, a big war like this, side with the most men and most money uh, will win, and I guess that was the case here. So even though Russia is kind of an odd thing there, but of course after Russia, the British, with their huge empire, they also put up the second most amount of men in Allied, Allied side. Now on the Central Power side, obviously the Germans had the largest military, as we've said many times. And you can see uh, it was quite large, larger than any other single country in the war period, including Russia, okay? So anyways, that also, that's why the Germans, of course, carried most of the kind of weight of the, uh, the Central Powers effort in this war. All right, so here's some pictures. You can see there's a, uh, on the left there, you have a British poster calling upon people from the current and former British Empire to enlist and fight. So the Empire needs men. It says Australia, Canada, India, New Zealand, Answer the call. Helped by the young lions, the old lion defies his foes. Okay, there on the right you actually see that's the lottery system. Okay, you actually see they're picking the names out of the uh, fishbowl there. Okay, that was in Britain. Okay, so there's the blindfold and they pull the names and of course everyone had a lottery number of an eligible age and of course if your name got pulled, you were expected to go fight. Okay, so we've had the draft numerous times in our country's history so we understand this pretty well. Okay, but every country at some point to some degree, did conscription. It was absolutely necessary to maintain the numbers needed to win. Okay? Now, in addition to drafting, you also want voluntary recruits. And, of course, when the war broke out, everyone was very eager. It was exciting. You know, we watched a video. Remember that video we watched a couple weeks ago where they were all talking about the beginning of the war? Everyone couldn't wait to go over there, and they were all excited. And then they said when they got over there, they realized what the war was like. They are like, yeah, maybe we made a mistake. Okay? So, anyways, early on, there were very high... Levels of enthusiasm, everyone thought the war was going to be short, and it was going to be great, and then of course, you know, recruitment dropped off. But there were, you know, big efforts to recruit. You wanted as many voluntary recruits as possible. So part of this was propaganda, we're going to talk more about that in a minute. You can see 
you know, famous posters like this one on the left, which of course became the model, which made one of the most famous American posters, the Uncle Sam Wants You poster, which you've all seen, right? You know that one? It actually was kind of a homage to this one, okay? And then of course the one on the right, this is actually probably the most well-known poster of the war worldwide. Uh, this poster here, you know, that kind of shames men into, you know, volunteering. You know, here's this guy, it's after the war, he's sitting with his kids, and they're saying to him, Daddy, what did you do during the Great War? You know, where were you? Did you fight? You know, or are you going to tell your kids, no, you sat on the sidelines and you missed out on the great adventure? So, you know, stuff like this, I mean, that's what propaganda does. It's designed to make you feel or act a certain way, even if you don't want to. So that's a pretty, uh, that's pretty effective, you know. It's shaming, like, look, you know, when, when this war is over, you know, are you going to have a story to tell? So anyways, that one was actually very, very effective and well-known during the war. All right, so speaking of propaganda, let's talk about that. Propaganda was used extensively in the war. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys are all familiar about propaganda. So propaganda, you see World War I nations use one-sided information called propaganda to maintain civilian support. So propaganda had one role, convince civilians and soldiers to support the war effort. Okay, keep, you know, morale high. That's what it does. I mean, propaganda I mean, propaganda exists in all kinds of forms. Propaganda still exists today, obviously. You know, it's not just used during war. We get propaganda all the time. Propaganda from countries, propaganda from political parties, you know. Anything that is a piece of media, basically, that tries to get you to feel or do something and may not present all of the facts objectively, that's propaganda. I would say 90% of the pictures on Facebook spread around are some kind of propaganda in some way. You know, they circulate and they get popular because they're trying to get you to feel or do something, right? So propaganda doesn't just show up in wartime, but it was, of course, used extensively. And, of course, in World War I, you know, before the television, before the Internet, propaganda posters were commonly used to encourage recruitment or to encourage people to financially support the war or to not be wasteful and things like that. So it was pretty important. Everyone had it. Okay? So propaganda posters and slogans ask the civilians to do their part by participating in conscription, rationing, and war bond sales. In addition, most governments censored the media. That's important. Governments during World War I and during wartime in general tend to be, you know, more careful with in terms of the, the information that they allow out. They'll be censoring, okay? And laws in these countries usually during World War One allowed legally the government to censor media. The United States was no exception. We talked about this last year. Last year, when we were talking about World War One, we talked about how during the war, the government passed laws that by today's standards, we would absolutely say they were unconstitutional. Does anyone remember some of the names of these laws? I can think of one big one that you absolutely were supposed to know last year. Yeah? The Espionage Act. Espionage and Sedition Act. Which basically said it is illegal for you to criticize the war effort. I mean, that's completely unconstitutional. But it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court actually said, no, it's okay. There was that Supreme Court case in my remember, it was called Schenck versus U.S. And then what they said was, you know, in times of crisis, speech, free speech can be curtailed if it presents a clear and present danger to the country. And the argument was that anti-war agitators, which in the U.S. were lots of people who didn't believe in the war, they were actually hindering the war efforts. They actually could be jailed. In fact, famously, once again, you'll all remember this, I hope, Eugene Debs, who was candidate for president, was arrested in jail for protesting the war. And he actually ran for president from a prison cell. So, so uh, you know, that was not out of the ordinary. That was very common in those days. Laws were created in these countries to prevent people from speaking out against the war effort because it was considered to be that important. So it doesn't matter if it's the United States, Germany, Britain, every country to some regard did censor. Okay, and this is actually very common in wartime. In fact, even in our most recent wars, I was just talking to our class about this, in our most recent wars, the ones in your lifetime, right, the war on terror, the government went to links to try and censor the media. There was a there was another famous Supreme Court case. During the Iraq War, I think I talked about this last year maybe, during the Iraq War, the government tried to censor media pictures showing cargo planes full of caskets draped with the American flag, which were dead soldiers' bodies being transported back home. And this, this was, of course, circulating. And the government didn't want people seeing this because 
seeing that Americans were dying in the war might think, oh, this maybe is not a good thing. So the government actually tried to censor it, and ultimately the Supreme Court in that case disagreed. Unlike in World War I, the government said, you know what? Uh-uh. That's free speech. People can need to see these pictures. So sometimes the Supreme Court, you know, has different views. But every war, you'll see some kind of variation of censorship. All right, so here's some propaganda you can look at. It's pretty self-explanatory. So the left one helped crush the menace of the sea. You got the bloody hand with the knife, obviously symbolizing the threat of the U-boats. Buy Liberty Bonds. Okay, that's how they raised money for the war. Irishmen avenge the Lusitania, join an Irish regiment. It's, you know, and Ireland was pretty interesting during the war because, of course, Ireland, um, you know, had a lot of hostility towards, of course, Great Britain because as they've had in their hundreds and hundreds of years of coexistence there, and uh, the Irish were kind of largely, you know, opposed to the to the war because, of course, the British were involved in it, and you know, so that that's actually an interesting poster to look at. Uh, and then the other one there, destroy this mad brute. This is an American poster, and of course, the guy there, that gorilla-looking thing there, that actually represents the Germans. You can see him, he's got the little German helmet, he's got the Kaiser Wilhelm mustache, and he's, he's dragging this woman off, I don't know. He's supposed to be King Kong. Yeah, it's kind of like that, but this is actually before King Kong. So, maybe King Kong is based on that poster, something like that. So anyways, um, you know, this is the kind of stuff we saw. You know, the Germans, you know, propaganda, it gets worse in World War II, propaganda also, you know, Propaganda is really interesting. There's a lot of different categories of things that propaganda can do that makes it propaganda. You know, taking a complex issue and boiling it down into black and white, good and evil, that's propaganda. Um, not telling you all the facts, you know, being less than objective. Propaganda also a lot of times will dehumanize the enemy, you know, in wartime. You know, the Germans, we call them the Hun, like that poster back there. You know, because of course the Huns were that group that destroyed Western civilization 1,500 years ago, approximately. So that's what the Germans are doing. They're going to destroy civilization, you know, or portraying them as a gorilla. You know, that's very common because part of getting people willing to fight is you have to dehumanize the enemy and convince people, look, these people deserve to die. They're less than human. So when you look at propaganda, it's going to be more so apparent. When we get to World War II, you know, the propaganda, I mean, it's, it's, it's vicious. You know, it takes people and it... You know, boils them down into racial caricatures and stereotypes so that we can look at them and see them as being less than human so that we can then go and kill them. Okay? So that's very common in propaganda. This is no, you know, you know, uh, it's, it's not out of the ordinary that, you know, we portray them as a gorilla or something. All right, let's call it rationing now. So in a total war, rationing means simply um, you are controlling the amount the materials that the consumer you know, public has you know, access to because you're trying to direct most of your resources to the war effort. So in a total war, if you're really in a total war, your, your civilian populace can't even get access to all the things that they enjoy during peacetime because those things have to be diverted to the war effort. Okay, So rationing, both voluntary rationing is expected, but also involuntary. So sometimes rationing was the government saying, look, we're actually going to control how much you can consume, whether it be food stuff or fuel or certain materials. Okay, so rationing programs allow people to use only small amounts of essential resources like food and fuel, because that had to go to the front. Governments directed supplies and resources to the soldiers on the front and control prices of goods at home. So economic controls are actually very common in wartime and in total war. You know, things that you would consider socialist or even maybe communists on an extreme example, are widely accepted in cap capitalist countries during wartime because the government has to take direct control over industry and you know, prices in order to maintain the war effort. Okay, so civilians needed tickets and coupons to be able to buy goods. Many people grew victory gardens to support rations. So victory gardens, people oftentimes would grow their own plants and vegetables. This was both self-sufficiency, but it was also just symbolic. Like, look, I support the war effort. Look, there's my victory guard. That is me demonstrating that I am supporting this war effort in addition to, of course, actually contributing to my own, you know, self-sustaining, my own food rather than consuming food that could be grown and used for our allies or for our soldiers or whatever. So victory gardens were very common um, as well as involuntary rationing. Yes? Well, victory gardens were something introduced by FDR. 
No, they're used in World War II as well, but they're actually used in this time period as well. Sometimes they're called Liberty Gardens. Didn't you know, what's that? Wasn't it like they grew those to send food to Belgium? Or? Well, we reject we we. we the, the thing was this. Most people didn't grow their own individual soap. Herbert Hoover, which maybe you might be more looking at. Herbert Hoover, before he was president, he was involved in what was called the Food Administration. The Food Administration was the organization during World War I that organized all this rationing and stuff. And we, most of our resources were going over to Europe to feed our allies. They couldn't feed themselves. So it was you sacrificed on the home front. And the way you could set, you could offset that sacrifice is by doing this. So people weren't sending their vegetables and things like that, but our massive industry of farmers, our agribusiness, they call it, they were sending all the food overseas, and people were offsetting it this way. But yeah, we were feeding, I mean, we were feeding the Allies to a large degree. And, uh, you know, Herbert Hoover, I mean, he, uh, that's where he became famous. I mean, he did such a tremendous job organizing the Food Administration that, he eventually, you know, that's what led to his political success in becoming president. Yeah. So the Food Administration, didn't they do stuff like, like with French fries, they called it like Liberty Potatoes? Well, okay. <laughs> Not French fries, because the French weren't, they were our ally. Yeah. What you're talking about is the Germans were enemy. Yeah. So things yeah. like uh, sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage. Yeah. Uh, Frankfurters became hot dogs, which we even call them that today. So yeah, I mean, we literally, this is crazy, uh, but we are crazy. Uh, we banned the teaching of German no. in high schools because you can't learn the language of the enemy, which actually I think that would be actually very useful to learn. Yeah, really. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure. But what you're, but of course, so what you're, you're liking it to is a very comical episode in American history, uh, in recent history, was you know when we went to war with Iraq. Uh, of course, uh, we were criticized by a good portion of the world. And one of the most vocal critics, who was a friend of ours, is France, and they said, "Look, you know, you're going on this on your own. You're not, you're not taking the UN. You're not doing this the right way." So, uh, in our, uh, I guess, in our congressional cafeteria, we renamed our fries "Freedom no. Fries" because we didn't want to eat French fries. So the French were oh, criticizing the Iraq. That's you guys embarrassing. Don't know this story? No. No. But anyways, that's what, you were kind of linking the two together. But the French were allies in World War One, yeah, so. Yeah. We weren't gonna criticize them, but we, you're at, but we absolutely uh, did criticize and diminish things German because they were the bad guys. But French fries are so much better than like American French fries. Wow. Oh, like French French fries? Yeah, like in France, they're yeah. so much better than what we have. It is true. Yes. It's objectively true, everyone. No, it's, it's objectively it's true. true. Okay, we don't have time to talk about it. Let's get on to the next thing. All right, so rationing and conservation obviously has its own propaganda. So you, you can see, I mean. Pretty clear, you know things like here they're talking about saving red meat. I was, you know, they would have the whole campaigns for meatless Mondays and things like that because every, you know, whatever you did not use, even voluntary, you know, that meant more. So people were both making their voluntary contributions, but of course there was also involuntary. You know, you know, you couldn't buy as much gasoline as you wanted. You had to have coupons. Okay, you could only get an amount because they needed to reserve most of that for overseas. And this was repeated in World War II. So there you, then there's another one that was, of course, obviously endorsing planting. Um, you know, your, your, your victory garden. So sow the seeds of victory. Every garden and munition plant. So they're likening you know, every garden supports the war effort just like munitions. All right, so here's some more. You can see here. Uh, the one on the left there is obviously endorsing saving fuel, coal. Okay, the middle one there says defeat the Kaiser and his U-boats. Victory depends on which fails first, food or frightfulness. Eat less wheat. This is just talking about conserving wheat. Okay, and I said air class, I said this is the original gluten-free. Before it was cool, we were gluten-free to, to defeat the Kaiser. And then, of course, oh, there's another one. There she is in her wheatless kitch kitchen. Okay, she is doing her part. So she, are you doing yours? Making you feel bad. Is that Blue Debbie? <laughs> so if you ate wheat that day, you had to hang your head in shame. But look at her skin. She's glowing because she's gluten free. She's gluten free. <laughs> gluten is the enemy. The real enemy, the Kaiser is not the enemy. Gluten. is the enemy. All right. So roll away. I already talked about this. Hold on. Hold on. We can finish up. So women, we already talked a lot about the role of women. So the role of women did expand during the war. Economically, you can look at there. 
Women replaced men in munitions and heavy industry. This was unusual, but it was a temporary fix. They also served at the bottom bolt point. Nurses, drivers, clerks, and were encouraged to support their husbands. Now, unlike World War II, we're not going to see really military roles open up for women. You, you know, in World War II, you get these auxiliary corps, they called them, where women were in the military officially, but they served in these kind of behind the lines, non combat, kind of clerical roles. We don't see a lot of that in World War II by really any country. Um, but women still, you know, in some cases were exposed to the front. You know, nurses and things like that would be up at the front doing things. Um, but for the most part, women were not encouraged to participate in the military yet. So that's not going to come out till later. And of course, even more so, more importantly, women, you know, for example, using the United States as an example, because of course we're most familiar with this, you know, women don't even see really full involvement in the military and equality with men until really this modern era. I mean, really, just a great example. Just in the last few years, I want to say it was two years ago, but I might be wrong on that, three at the most. Just in the last few years, we have for the first time opened up combat roles to women. That's just a brand new thing. So now women can actually participate in every single military role that men can, provided they meet the same requirements, which can be difficult. But women, just a couple months ago, I think we just had our first two female rangers. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah, which is, rangers are not special forces, but they're like a step down. They're elite infantry, so it's very hard to do that physically. We have women now doing that. So, but that's, I mean, that's recent history. That's the last two or three years we've allowed women to do that. Before that, this stuff was unheard of. So we're still evolving on this issue, even though other countries have had female participation for quite some time. Like Israel. Like Israel has mandatory participation from all its citizens. But even going back before that, you know, in World War II, the Russians... They did not shy away from allowing women to serve in combat roles directly on the front in that war because they were so desperately needed to even the, you know, the, the battlefield there. So here's some more posters that you can see. <clears throat> These are encouraging women not only to, you know, not only did they want women to support the war effort by supporting their husbands to enlist, they also wanted women, of course, do their part by working industry. So, you know, look at the one on the right there. This is a very famous poster. Says these women are doing their bit. You know the guy in the back, he's marching off the battle, and she's going into the factory. She's taking his job, taking his place. She's going to work in the munitions factory while he goes and fights. So this was very important. This was being done largely in all the nations at war. Okay, let's finish up here. Financing the war. So large wars obviously require a lot of money. This of course meant borrowing. Okay. Now, in addition to borrowing, governments had to also orchestrate the economy and the, the financing of the war, which meant they had to regulate business and working hours, and in many cases they had to uh, control labor unions. You know, anything that could impede the war effort could be controlled by government during this time period. As I said before, you know, in normal circumstances, we would consider these, at least in the United States and other countries that are like us, uh, we would consider many of these policies to be more socialistic, um, and we probably would not go for them because we, of course, are more capitalistic. But during wartime, we tend to accept greater government regulation and intrusion as part of a necessary kind of component of winning a total war. Okay. Now, in order to pay for the war, we had to borrow extensively. Now, you can borrow from other countries still, but of course, many countries are at war. So, when that is the case, many times countries will turn to their own citizens for their money. So, what they did was we actually borrowed money from our own citizens through liberty bonds or victory loans or victory bonds or war bonds, whatever. Okay, they're all the same thing. War bonds is more the collective term. A war bond is simply uh, where civilians will loan money to the government to fight the war effort, and then of course they are promised that they will be repaid at a later date, usually after the war. Okay, so this is a way that citizens can patriotically support the war effort. And by the way, people did, during large wars like this, people tend to have more surplus money because there's nothing to buy. You know, the consumer market is so devoid of consumer products because everything is for the war effort, you're kind of finding yourself with savings because you don't have anything to spend it on, there's nothing to buy. So if you have savings and you were a patriotic citizen, you were encouraged through propaganda campaigns to buy war bonds. They were called different things. That poster back there that says, Halt the Hun, 
talk about the third liberty loan. You know, that's an example. That's a war bond. Give us the money. We're going to fight the war with it, and then you can redeem it later. Okay, and you'll get paid back, and you'll have done your your patriotic duty. So this was largely how we helped. In addition to regular tax laws, this is largely how we financed the war. And when I say we, I mean not just the United States. I, I should say really all the countries engaged in this kind of uh, borrowing to some degree. All right, now you look at the numbers financially. Just some numbers for you to look at. You, know, you look at the Allies. You know, Britain, with its large empire, spent the most money. However, the United States, even though we were only officially at war for about a year, we still spent a very large amount of money. You can see second only uh, Britain. And then if you look at the Central Power side, you can see that uh, Germany, of course, bore a very heavy financial cost. Um, and of course, that is going to decimate them because you know at the end of the war, not only have they spent this money, but you know they lost the war. So they are not even going to be able to offset that with you know, territorial expansion and things like that. So this is going to be crippling, crippling. But some countries did benefit. I mean, the United States, we benefited from this. This kind of spending, you know, we had full employment during the war, and we emerged from the war economically stronger than we went in. And, of course, think about what, what decade followed the war. Roaring 20s. The Roaring Twenties, which was, at least superficially, one of the most prosperous decades in history. Okay, yeah. So in today's money, that would be like trillions, right? It wouldn't be trillions, but it would trillion. be it would be maybe a trillion, yeah. yeah. It'd be a lot of money, certainly. Yeah. So when if you um bring up how Germany purges and they go because they have the allies, would you use that for support? Yeah, I would use that. I mean look at look at the financial yeah. contributions of <laughs> Bulgaria and Turkey. Hey, they were really trying there. Huh? Can you just say they really didn't contribute? I would just say that, you know, their contributions to the war effort were lo Far less than the other the allies of the actual allied warring countries. Because when you look at it, I mean, we all know that Germany, when Germany wasn't in the fight, typically the Central Powers struggled, with a few, of course, exceptions. But when when the Germans were not there backing up the rest of their countries, I mean, they were doing a lot of it. Yeah, Brian. Why is uh, that one hundred negative? Yeah. yeah. Probably because that means they had to borrow more than they actually contributed. They, they actually cost more because, of course, people had to offset their, their demands. That's my guess. I don't know exactly, but that's of course Greece. All right, so look here. As I mentioned, war bonds. You know, you look here, you know, just some more propaganda posters. You can see the kind of what they were doing here. So there's a British one, and, of course, there's an American one there on the right. It's very similar. Um, but this was, you know... I'm showing you mostly Western ones, but you know this is the kind of stuff that was going on in all countries to help finance the war. Do you have any like German ones? Uh, I do on the on a different PowerPoint for World War II. I'll show you some. I didn't have one for the World War One. Yeah. What about the savings bonds? I heard that like, it kind of didn't... It's the same premise, but the savings bond is not something that's um, direct towards a war effort. It's the same premise, though. The government uh, guarantees your money, and they use the money. Um, you know, just like banks do. I mean, when you when you put your money in a bank, I mean, it's the same concept. When you put your money in the bank, the bank uses the giant, the, this big pool of finances to help pay for things like mortgages and you know, student loans and things like that. Um, but of course, your money is also guaranteed. So that works. You know, banks work as long as not everyone tries to pull their money out at once. And then, of course, if that actually happened, which you know, bank like in the twenties, then you would have a disaster. But luckily, that doesn't really happen. Yeah, like what happens? Say. They're guaranteed the money, but then something that was saving to happen. Like you lose the war? Yeah, like I don't know. You don't get paid back. You better hope you win. Did Germans get paid back? Probably not, because of course they went into the worst depression in their history following, so I'm guessing that they probably took a hit there. Yeah. They couldn't even pay like that. The rate was so high that, like, if you do, you get paid back, and then your money is just, you know. What, in Germany? Yeah. Yeah, they had a hard time. Like, like fifty. Yeah, we're gonna get to that in a little bit. Okay, hold on. I gotta move along. We only got a few minutes. I'm, I gotta finish this. All right. So last thing we need to talk about, of course, total war um, entails attacks on civilians. Now, you know, there were deliberate. There was there was two kinds. You had deliberate direct attacks on on civilians, like the ones you see here, and then you had your indirect attacks, which are things like a blockade. But here's the thing. Both sides 
All everyone in warring in this this war had the willingness to attack civilians. This was not a one side thing. Everyone was willing to attack civilians to win this war. Now the only thing that makes this different than World War II. Now World War II, we're going to see civilian death toll is just staggering. We don't see it as much as high. What I mean by that is in World War II, civilian death toll is it's so much higher than the actual you know military death toll. It's it's almost you know you can't even compare the two. World War One's a little different. Okay. The willingness to, war, to wage war on civilians existed in World War One, but the ability to do so was not quite there due to technology. So yes, you had direct attacks on civilians, like bombing campaigns. You know, early in the war, the Germans, of course, attempted to bomb London. They used, you know, uh, zeppelins. And then later, of course, when they, they were the, the Allies used countermeasures to shoot down the zeppelins, they resorted to planes. Okay, of course, these planes, unlike in World War Two, you know, they couldn't carry a very high bombing load. They didn't have the range and the durability. So. Yes, there were direct attacks on civilians by air, but for the most part, they are insignificant when you talk about the death toll because the technology just couldn't do it. The, the thousand plane bombing raids that leveled cities in World War II, the technology's not there. I can promise you if they had the technology, they would have used it. But it's not until World War II that we see that. So while this is important, it's small in scale when we look at the actual death toll. Okay. Now you look at loss of life and things like invasion and occupation. You know, Belgium, an example. And when Belgium was invaded by the Germans, of course, they were accused of committing atrocity against the uh, Belgian citizens. Which, you know, arguably there were some atrocities, although it may have been exaggerated by the British propaganda uh, industry to, you know, of course, encourage people to turn against the Germans. But there is no doubt that civilians were killed through both indirect and direct means. And you know, it may not have consistently been as uh, you know, blatant as this picture, which you know, is, is not exactly you know, guaranteed to be the way things went down, but we do know that people died. So of course, you know, people were gonna be caught in the crossfire, whether they be Belgian or later on, people in France, you know, people did die during that. But of course, the attack on Belgium was widely spread and is instrumental in turning the United States and the British against the Germans. Um, of course, we also talked about, just last week, talked about the Armenian Genocide. The Armenian Genocide is not a direct component of World War I, but it is part of World War I because without World War I, you would not have probably had this incident. World War I created the conditions necessary where this could happen, or the conditions also where you know, the Ottomans would turn against this entire population, as you saw. So it's, li it's pretty likely that we wouldn't have had this happen. So because of that, just like you know, when we look at World War II, when you look at the death toll of World War II, we do not separate the Holocaust. The Holocaust is included because the Holocaust was, of course, part of the things that caused the war and all that. So we look at the Armenian Genocide, which, remember, this is a million people. We estimate about a million people died in just this one thing. So we do include this, and of course, this was done against civilians. These were not combatants. Okay, Warring, you know, if it was an attack on combatants, it, it, it really wouldn't have um, probably been considered a genocide. Although, of course, the Turkish government would argue that these deaths uh, were largely caused as a result of a civil war, which would then not make it genocide. But of course, we all know that that's not true. Um, now, indirectly, the biggest cause of death on the Central Power side, in terms of civilians, was caused by the Allied blockade. The Allied blockade was an indirect attack on civilians. Yes, the, the purpose here was not necessarily to directly kill civilians, but as a result, people died in large numbers. Because of course, the lack of fuel and food that was reaching the Central Powers nations put you know, a lot of hardships on the civilian populace. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the blockade, is to hurt the civilian populace and make them so unhappy that they demand their government quit the war. So that, that was their fault, yeah. Okay, where were Germany and the other Central Powers to get food from? Well, even in the beginning of the war, they could have even gotten it theoretically from us, because we were a neutral player. The real reason Germany didn't get supplies from us in the very beginning, before we had really made formed an opinion, is because the British had such a strong blockade, it just wasn't even an option. We weren't going to run the blockade, yeah. so we were forced to only doing business with the uh, the Allies. But where would they have gotten it, like, after? They could have gotten it from any neutral nation, nation that would have had to ship to them, either by sea or something like that. Um, of course, the Germans also had their own blockade. We also know this was hurting civilians. Not only was it denying food from reaching places like England, which have a lot of problems because that, but also you can talk about the direct cause of death. You know, merchant ships, these are civilians, were being sunk by German U-boats. This was killing sailors. You know, look at the Lusitania, perfect example. The Lusitania had over 1,000 people die as a result of that ship being sunk. That is a direct attack on civilians. 
Okay, so you know these blockades, but particularly the German blockade, because the, the British blockade for the most part did not uh, wage unrestricted warfare. The German blockade was both direct and indirect attacks on civilians. Okay, so lastly, look at the death toll. This chart's kind of important. It's more important when you compare it to World War II later. But you can look at, here's the important thing to remember. In World War I, the death toll, still the majority of people killed by the war were combatants. That is a key thing to remember in World War I. We're at a turning point in history, though. World War I will be the last big war in which the majority of deaths are combatants. After World War I, let me look at World War II, okay, civilians will bear the greatest brunt of the, the death toll, okay? You can also look at the numbers there. You can see the Entente, okay, most of their losses were military. So that means the central powers lost proportionally more civilians, okay? And that's largely as a result of the blockade and things like that. Although the Entente lost a lot of civilians, particularly when you talk about in Russia and places like that. They got hit the hardest. So keep that in mind. Look at that graph. Kind of have a general idea of what it says, because you need to remember that. So when we get to World War II, you're going to see a transformation taking place that's going to affect warfare.